what I want to do is give you a broad overview of all of the wars that France was in at this time, and then talk about in a little bit more detail exactly what Napoleon was up to and his role in uh, either beginning or ending many of these wars. So you might remember from 1792 to 1797, you had your War of the First Coalition. First Coalition. And the players there were Prussia, Prussia, Austria, Austria, and Great Britain. I'll just write Britain for short. And this was essentially started by the French. Uh, you might remember King uh, Louis the Sixteenth was alive then. He like he supported the war because he thought that they would lose and maybe reinstate him, or that it would make him popular. The revolutionaries liked the war because they wanted to spread the revolution. And you might remember it ended at the Treaty of Campo Formio. Campo Formio in 1797 due mainly to Napoleon's victories in Italy. This was Campo Formio there. At that time, he was in charge of the Italian campaign. And, and the, the government of France at that time was the directory, in power to a, to a large degree because of uh, Napoleon's ability to defend them. Then from 1798, let me do this in a different color, from 1798, to 1802, you have the Second Coalition. Second Coalition. Now you might immediately see, Napoleon took power at the end of 1799. So this war spanned some of the Directory being in control and some of uh, Napoleon as First Council being in control. And here the players, once again, you have Austria and Great Britain. They tend to be always at war with France at this period, especially Great Britain. And instead of Prussia, you have Russia. You have Russia. And actually, just to help you visualize what the Austrian Empire looked like at this time and the Prussian Empire, you know, this map doesn't do it justice. Let me go down, let me go down to this map. That's in 1810. Let me go a little bit earlier here. This is in 1805. And I'll draw the boundaries a little bit bolder than they did. So this is France. This is these are the boundaries of France. Actually, it was able to take some territory in what is now Italy. So this is that is France right there. I could do the whole boundary if you like, but I think you get the idea. But the one empire that existed then that doesn't exist in its current form was Prussia. Doesn't even exist at all. There is no Prussian Empire or Prussian nation or the country of Prussia anymore can see there. It had some overlap with Germany, some overlap with Poland, some other countries. Won't go into detail there. And then you have the Austrian Empire. Austrian Empire. Austrian Empire is right over there. Right over there. As you can see, it is much, it encompasses much more than just the modern nation or country of Austria. And then you have the Russian Empire, which, you know, give or take, looks not too different than Russia today. But the big difference between the world, and there's many differences, between the world now and the world then, was that there was no nation of Germany. You had a bunch of people speaking German, but they were divided into a bunch of small little states. This map doesn't show it. Some of them were under Austrian control. Some of them were Prus under Prussian control. And this loose confederation of German uh, kingdoms and states this was called the Holy Roman Empire. Let me write that down. Holy Roman Empire. And as Voltaire famously said, they were neither holy nor Roman. They didn't speak Latin. They weren't Italian. They were German. It wasn't holy. This wasn't, you know, it wasn't controlled by a religious figure. And it wasn't an empire. It wasn't a tightly controlled state that was kind of expanding its boundaries. It was this loose confederation of kingdoms. So just that gives you a visualization of what the world looked like right then. So with that in mind, let me go back to my overview. My overview right there. And then the the second coalition. It was ended, well, in 1801, 1801, you had the Treaty of Lunaville. Once again, this was, this was a defeat of, Aust of the Austrians, 
mainly due to the military capabilities. Napoleon was now in charge of France, but he led once again an Italian campaign against against the uh, Italian against the Austrians. This is his victory in Moreno right there. I'll go into a little more detail on that. And that essentially declared victory on Austria, allowed Napoleon to take more territory in along the Italian peninsula. You can see it right there along the Italian peninsula right there. And then later he had the Treaty of Amiens with the British in 1802, and that end, really ended the coalition. I guess you could say the coalition ended in 1801, because Austria was out of it. Russia was kind of just passively observing. I mean, they, they participated, but they didn't really uh, give or take or lose anything. And then I could say, at this point, the United Kingdom. Uh, essentially, they were, it was, I guess, the best explanation of why it ended. It was war fatigue. But we'll see that they weren't tired for long. Because then in May of 1803, in May of 1803, you have the beginning of your third coalition. And I will go into a little bit more detail about this. But third coalition, Britain declares war on what we could call the French Empire. And this isn't going to end until 1805. So you can see Great Britain's essentially at war uh, uh, almost, uh, well, really, uh, continuously. They're, they're continu I mean, there's a few gaps, give or take, but there's always this tension. This is the third coalition. Coalition, and once again we have. I could write the United Kingdom if you like, because they actually now it is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. We have the United Kingdom in there. We have Russia in there. And once again we have Austria. And there were other players. There was Portugal, but these were the prime players. And we'll see in this video that this, the third coalition, the war of the third coalition, really ended with. Napoleon being the dominant power in Europe and ended with him essentially thinking that he is unstoppable. So I'll do a little bit more detail on that. This resulted in 1805 with the then Emperor Napoleon, and we'll talk about how he became emperor. But in 1805, Napoleon, or maybe I should say 1806, because this ended at the end of 1805, Napoleon views himself as unstoppable, as invincible. Invincible. He got some good victories that fed his already large ego. So with this as an overview, let's, I guess, review a little bit of the life of Napoleon and the roles that he directly played in pretty much all of these conflicts. So the first time we heard about Napoleon was in 1793. And I'll just draw it right here. You might remember there were all of these royalist insurrections going on against the revolutionary government. And they had this bright artillery captain in Toulon who put down an uprising there in 1793. He got some, I guess you could say, uh, 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 France-wide or nationwide fame from doing that. Then in 1795, you, you might remember. You might remember the directory was trying to get formed in Paris. So this is 1793. Then in 1795, let me do a better color than that. That's hard to read. In 1795, he was he defended the Tuileries by essentially sending out that grape shot and mowing down people to uh, keep the royalists from taking out the revolutionary government. So once again, hugely, hugely popular. So that was in 70. So all of that was occurring during the War of the First Coalition. And then Napoleon was sent, was made the general in charge of the Italian campaign. And in 1797, he was essentially en able to end the War of the First First Coalition in a victorious way for France by defeating Austria and Italy. And that, and that ended the First Coalition with the Campo Formio. This was Napoleon. That was. Napoleon right there. Then you might remember, OK, you know, he's this hugely popular guy. He actually started publishing uh, some newspapers. And he actually sent some military generals to put down uh, further counter-revolutions on, on the part of the royalists. So he became even more and more popular. And but the directory was a little bit of afraid of him at this point. So they said, hey, you know, why don't you go do whatever you want? And that's when Napoleon, he left from Toulon, and he went to Egypt. He went to Egypt with his visions of grandeur, where he did all of the uh, damage down there and uh, 
you know, and, and killed and won multiple wars against uh, the Ottomans in both Egypt and Syria. But unfortunately for him, his good friend Horatio Nelson destroyed his whole fleet in the Battle of the Nile. Horatio, let me write that in a darker color. So that is Horatio Nelson destroyed his entire fleet there. So they were stranded in 1799. Napoleon was essentially able to uh, abandon all of his troops and then come back to France on his own. So this is in 1799. Napoleon makes his way makes his way back to France. And then we saw in the last video, he takes power with two of the directors as the three consuls of France. But in short order, he is able to declare himself as first consul in 1799. This is hard to read. Let me do in this. So in 1799, 1799 he is first, first consul and is in, essentially the dictator or the authoritarian ruler of France. But all of while this was happening, remember, this was all during the War of the Second Coalition. In 1798, you know, he wasn't much help in that war. He was out in Egypt doing all of these silly things. They were at war with Britain. That's why Horatio Nelson went and destroyed his fleet. But even after he takes power at the end of 1799 or early 1800, they're still at war. So Napoleon, he decides to take things, take charge. So he leads the troops across the Alps into Italy, into Italy right here. And once again, this pattern is emerging. He and it, and this one actually wasn't very clear in the beginning that it was going to go his way. The Italian campaign it started very badly, but eventually he was able to win against once again the Austrians at the Battle of Moreno and Hohenlinden. I know I'm probably not saying all of these well, but once again, through uh, Napoleon directly leading the troops, he was able to end the War of the Second Coalition. And then the, and then the United Kingdom, or Great Britain, however you want to call it, Great Britain tends to, or great the, you know, Many times when people use the word Great Britain, it's referring to the entire United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. If you wanted to be formal, Great Britain refers just to the island of Great Britain that has England and Scotland and Wales on it. Well, this is Ireland. But I don't feel like keep repeatedly saying the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, which was uh, now united in, in the early 1800s. I'll just keep saying Great Britain. But there was just fatigue. So the war essentially ended with Great Britain as well. This is, as we said before, this was the Treaty of Amiens. But very, very, very short-lived peace. Because then in 1803, with Napoleon still in power, the, the, uh, the third coalition formed. And in the next video, we're going to see exactly how Napoleon was able to once again be victorious over these powers to become, essentially, in his mind, invincible.